As blacks moved north during the Great Migration of 1916 to 1921, Cleveland's black population increased. While this was less than 2% of the total, job opportunities for blacks had become more restricted. New employment in the expanding steel and manufacturing industry restricted blacks to unskilled labor. Traditional black trades such as barbering and catering began to be filled by the flood of European immigrants to Cleveland. Unions excluded blacks from working in the skilled trade as carpenters, masons, painters, and paper hangers. Between 1870 and 1910, the employment of blacks in skilled trades declined from 31.7% to 11%. As a consequence, the economic progress of Cleveland's blacks was quickly overshadowed by that of foreign-born immigrants and black home ownership declined sharply. Housing restrictions restricted blacks to the ghetto west of East 55th Street on a strip bordered by Euclid Avenue in the north and Woodland Avenue to the south. By 1915, Cleveland's YWCA and YMCA had prohibited blacks from membership and hospitals began to segregate them into separate wards. While Cleveland schools managed to remain integrated throughout this period, blacks were increasingly excluded from restaurants and theaters. More and more, the discriminatory conditions that had driven Southern blacks north were appearing in Cleveland. Still, there were individuals who managed to succeed. Charles Chestnut became Cleveland's best-selling author. He received national recognition for his writing. His depictions of life and racial issues from the African-American viewpoint caused the Atlantic Monthly to place him in the top rank of American short story writers. Others dedicated themselves to improving the lot of Cleveland's African-Americans. Eliza Bryant, a former slave, established the city's first black-supported non-religious welfare institution. Black Republican John P. Green, the father of Labor Day, was elected by a majority white constituency into the Ohio House in 1881. A decade later, he became Ohio's first black state senator. Jane Edna Hunter came to Cleveland in 1905 hoping to find some employment as a nurse. After she was excluded from the YWCA and the only room she could find was in a house of questionable morals, she decided to make it her life's work to find safe, wholesome living quarters for unmarried, poor, homeless black women and girls seeking employment in the city. The organization she founded was named the Phyllis Wheatley Society in honor of the first Negro poet in America. By 1948, the facility had grown into a nine-story structure at East 46th and Cedar and offered a dining hall, gymnasium, club rooms, a dramatic group, a summer camp, a day nursery, and a music school. It served as a model for other institutions throughout the United States. George Myers, who owned a barbershop in the Holiday Hotel, was a close political ally of industrialist and political leader Marcus Hanna. As a delegate to the 1892 Republican Convention, he cast the vote that led to Hanna's election as a national committee man and eventually to the nomination of William McKinley for president. Myers' support earned him the promise of a political appointment which he turned down because of the 35 people he was responsible for employing in his barbershop. When Myers died, the hotel in which his barbershop was located replaced all his employees with whites. Another organization that greatly enriched the lives of black Clevelanders was Karamu House. In 1915, two white Oberlin graduates and social workers, Rowena and Russell Jelliff, bought two clapboard houses on East 38th Street. They lived in three rooms in the rear of one of the houses and opened the other as a recreational center for area youth. The neighborhood, then known as the Roaring Third, was filled with pool halls, bars, 
and other places of dubious entertainment. It also contained almost all the city's black population, as well as a mixture of poor Austrians, Jews, Italians, Russians, Syrians, and Chinese. As more southern blacks migrated into the area, the Jellifs' houses became known as the Negro Settlement. Their open-door policy of inviting neighborhood people into both houses for classes, workshops, and counseling met with some suspicion. At first, Playhouse Settlement offered games and athletics in addition to art and theatrics. Later, the Jellifs came to believe that the self-expression offered by art and theatrics seemed to bring participants more lasting satisfaction in such a way as to improve their futures. In 1927, the house actors, the Gilpin players, remodeled an adjacent property into a theater. They named it Kiramu, Swahili for a place of joyful meeting. Hazel Mountain Walker, who researched the name, later became the city's first black school principal. In the 1920s and 30s, Kiramu was the first theater to produce the plays of Langston Hughes. Hughes was a Clevelander and a major 20th century writer who had been encouraged in his early efforts by the Jellifs. During Karamu's 1948-49 season, the indomitable Zelma George sang the title role in Giancarlo's Minotti's The Medium. Soon after, New York producers asked her to sing the role on Broadway. George graduated from the University of Chicago with a degree in sociology. While a probation officer with the Chicago Juvenile Court, she studied pipe organ at Northwestern and voice at the American Conservatory of Music. At the same time, she was supporting four siblings. After 12 years, when the last sibling graduated from college, she moved to New York to study black music on a Rockefeller grant and earned a master's degree in personnel administration at New York University. After she married, her Cleveland home hosted people such as Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Booker T. Washington, and W.E.B. Du Bois. In 1954, George received her Ph.D. from NYU. Three years later, she undertook a six-month tour of the world as a goodwill ambassador for the U.S. State Department. In 1960, President Dwight D. Eisenhower appointed her a member of the U.S. delegation to the United Nations. By the 1930s, there were 72,000 blacks residing in Cleveland out of a total population of about 900,000. The Central Avenue neighborhood grew even more overcrowded as increasing incidents of racial violence kept even middle-class blacks from moving to the suburbs. Discrimination in public accommodations increased. Restaurants overcharged blacks in order to discourage their patronage. Theaters relegated them to the balconies and amusement parks refused to let them enter. In 1930, Mary Brown Martin, one of the few Cleveland black women active in the women's suffrage movement, became the first black person elected to the school board. However, the growth of the ghetto together with the new policy that allowed whites to transfer out of schools led to segregation. Black schools increasingly shifted away from a liberal arts curriculum to manual training. Migrants continued to pour into the area, however, to feel the need for industrialized jobs and for the chance to move up into a skilled and semi-skilled position. This rapid population growth and the lack of good jobs for blacks in the white community created opportunities for black businessmen and professionals. J. Walter Wills became founder and director of the state's largest black funeral home. He helped organize the first black business organization, the Cleveland Board of Trade in 1908. 